So today we're privileged to have Dr. Lloyd Trotman. And uh, since he's gonna tell you about himself a little bit, I'm not gonna give too much of an introduction. I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Lloyd. And let me remind you that at the bottom, you have the ability to ask questions and to um, uh, be able to raise your hand. I see there's already a, a question about tumors. Uh, Lloyd, you'll have to pay attention to your Q&A. There's a question already. Uh, we'll get to those and we'll use the chat uh, and we'll make it as interactive as possible uh, in that. So I'm gonna turn it really mostly over to Lloyd and I'll see you at the other end. Great, thanks, uh, Jason. So uh, it, it's really great to be here. Uh, I, I really like to talk in front of uh, students as much as I can, and I hope I'll soon be able to do that again. So by means of introduction, um, you, you should hear about who I am and how I got to where I am. Um, uh, and <laughs> what I want to know is uh, who you guys are, even though I don't see you, and, and, and uh, find out a few things about you, because I also was a high school student at some point. So um, uh, I actually was uh, born in New York, um, uh, so not, not too far from here. Uh, but um, my family, we only lived here for a couple of years. And uh, um, uh, my dad was originally from the Caribbean and my mother is Swiss. So we moved to Switzerland where I grew up um, and went to school. And um, uh, just to keep things short and then come back, uh, I went to school there, through high school, did my college there. And after college, um, a PhD also in, in, in Switzerland. So the German speaking part uh, of uh, Switzerland, there are three languages spoken there. Um, but I knew I always wanted to uh, come uh, to the US and uh, particularly back to New York. And so I uh, found uh, an opportunity for, after my PhD for a postdoc study um, at uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the city, Upper East Side. And so I was working there for about four or five years. And uh, since things went really well, uh, I um, uh, was able to get a faculty position after that um, here at Cold Spring Harbor. So not so far away from the city. Um, and my interest then and also now um, has been in understanding cancer. And that's what I've been doing here, uh, running a, a research lab for uh, 14 years now, I think um, it is already. Um, so, but the, the part that I really um, uh, would like to hear from you about uh, a bit more, tell you a bit more about is actually how I got to becoming a scientist, right? Because today, I mean, there's no other way to call it out. I am uh, a scientist, nothing much else I can do. And, and so the, uh, the, the question, um, that I'm asking myself is essentially how this happened and, and when it happened. And so the first thing that I can say essentially without, without any doubt uh, is that when I graduated, um, I really did not know what I was gonna be doing. And, and um, I was wondering, you know, uh, uh, can you guys tell me if there are people who really, really know, you know, if you're high school, uh, uh, towards the end of high school age, and you really know what you want to be doing, you found the thing that you think is, is really the thing that you want to be doing. Can you tell me if that's the case and what it is? Because I wonder how many people were in that situation. Um, uh, I, 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 I definitely was not. I assume most of the people who are here now have a certain interest in science, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be here. But um, uh, if, if you have some time uh, in the chat um, uh, or the Q&A, uh, type it in because I really, I'm having an eye on it. I, I really, really wonder. So the question then is, you know, not having a clear concept of what I was gonna do um, uh, at around, uh, uh, you know, high school graduation time, um, I mean, clearly I knew kind of what I was better at and what I wasn't so good at. And, uh, and so the, um, the, the thing to do then was obviously follow the things that you are better at um, because they, they seem to be more fun. 
And, and what I had developed is a bit of knack of for, for chemistry. I, I liked chemistry quite a bit. Um, um, and so I thought I was gonna study chemistry. Um, the, the, um, the thing though, that I also uh, have to say, and this is actually interesting because I ended up, as you can tell now, I'm doing uh, cancer research. So um, this is really a part of biology. The thing that I would have told you at that time for sure uh, is that I wouldn't be doing biology. And, and that had a lot to do with uh, the teachers that we had or so. I thought it was really not interesting. I didn't, you know, didn't really capture my my uh, uh, imagination and interest. So nothing much happened uh, in terms of biology, but chemistry I thought was really fun. What I was going to tell you is that, you know, when I started studying um, there actually, um, so I, I went on to college and, you know, uh, I had many of the science classes that you can imagine or that you can be thinking about when you talk to people that have been at college. But then one thing that did happen and uh, is something I was totally unexpected. Um, and that is that I did find something that for me was, you know, the coolest thing ever. And that's um, after um, two years, two and a half years of actually being in college, we had our first independent um, lab and that was a, a chemistry lab. And it was a completely independent lab. So essentially you get the key to the lab in the morning and you have to be out sometime 7, 30, 8 o'clock. So you have something like 12 hours a day. You also have lectures, whatever. But during that day, um, you can be there anytime and you have to get your stuff through and you have about a week, two or three weeks um, to finish a project with a mentor. And that was the first time that I actually did um, what um, an experimental biologist does, working at the bench. And that's when it clicked. I mean, I definitely realized that this is what I want to do. Um, but there was no way that any of the lab stuff that I'd ever done before in school or, yeah, you name it, uh, uh, even the school chem lab or wh whatever, that was nothing like that, okay? And there was no way I would have known, you know, this is where I want to be. But that, that then clearly told me or showed me that, you know, I, I, I want to be an experimentalist. I, I want to find out stuff. Um, uh, it has a lot to do with, um, it's a bit like, you know, combination of Lego. I mean, you have to, you know, chemistry lab, you have to set up your reactions, which requires some skill and some experience. Obviously it's trial and error, things go wrong. They, they can really go wrong. In fact, we tried to not kill each other. That was one of the big, big things. Um, uh, but then, you know, you get better at it and uh, um, uh, like cooking or so, you're, you're improving your reactions, you're measuring what you get out and you, you go from mediocre to better and better. And then over the weeks, you develop something and you're supposed to do a synthesis, deliver something. And, and, and this back and forth between the lab, the bench, uh, and then hitting the books and trying to find out what actually went on, I realized that's what I want to do. And, um, uh, and moving on, I realized um, actually biology and, and, and this kind of uh, thing in, in, in molecular biology is, is really exciting. So, so um, the, 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 the bottom line here is that um, you will take your time, but I think it's worth to take your time to find the thing that um, you really, really like and care about. And at least in my case, I think it came from a completely unexpected angle. And in the end, it was biological research. And, and it's like the combination of chemistry and biology that really got me excited. And so um, um, I see we have some questions and, uh, and so on in the, in the Q&A, and I'll get to those in the end, okay? If there's no, nothing on the uh, uh, topic of uh, what am I gonna do, then I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna show you what we're actually doing today. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, hold on a second. Share 
share this screen. Okay. Yes, here we are. All right. Okay. So we're doing prostate cancer research. And um, I'm not doing this alone, it's a team. Uh, and you can see there are people at, uh, at different stages of their careers, their students, uh, there's people that have a PhD already, there's people that do more computer work, and there's people that do bench work like I did. Um, and, uh, and it's also, there's quite a bit of turnover. So um, it's it, the cool thing, uh, thing that I really like about um, uh, our, our, our team is that it essentially is evolving all the time. People come and go. And so um, the thing that we're working on is something a bit strange and I don't want to dwell on it too much, but uh, you know, uh, you've heard the word prostate and we're working on prostate cancer. Um, but the, the, the amazing thing about this is that nobody would ever talk about prostate uh, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that you can actually get a cancer uh, of the prostate. The prostate is a gland that, that does something, you know, uh, uh, that's not even, that's not even uh, essential. You can remove it and, and still have a fine life. Only men have it. It, it um, uh, adds a fluid uh, to sperm so that that um, uh, keeps longer. But it's not something that's needed and it wouldn't, as I mentioned, nobody would know about it or talk about it if it weren't for the fact that, you know, after age 65, 70, you have a one in eight chance as a man to actually develop a cancer in the prostate, which means that these cells of the prostate that usually don't divide very much, all of a sudden start to divide very much. Um, and that's, you know, for reasons that have to do with uh, changes uh, in their DNA mutations. But what then happens is um, uh, what is essentially shown down here in this black and white image, which is a part of a radio uh, uh, scan of a person where you see these black dots uh, all over the person's body. And these are actual prostate cells that have moved out of the prostate and disseminated or uh, colonized um, uh, uh, other parts of the body. And so uh, uh, this is probably uh, a bunch of cells that have, um, uh, uh, that are sitting on a rib cage. So many of those cells start to uh, um, uh, sit on bone and then expand there. And they're also uh, expanding in other sites. And that ultimately results to um, uh, widespread failures and death. Um, but this is a very rare thing. So most uh, patients actually that have prostate cancer will have prostate cancer that stays in the prostate. And that's shown here, up uh, here. It's called indolent prostate cancer. And so those people will have an okay life. They, they might need a surgery or so, but they're not going to die of that. But then a, a minority of uh, people will have this kind of metastatic disease that uh, will kill. And so we're all trying to find out What's the difference between the one that stays in the prostate and the one that moves away? So how does that work? How does that happen? We're, we've taken a special way, a special approach um, to do that. And that's called mouse modeling. So we use animal research to recreate a disease that happens in human, right? So the prostate cancer is a human disease. Mice do not get prostate cancer. However, we realize that if we're able to recapitulate and engineer the normal process of prostate cancer in a mouse, then we can analyze it and we can also use these animals to do therapies. And both of these things, the kind of analysis, meaning you know, dissection of the tumor, really understanding what's going on at a particular point in time, but then also the therapy, which is experimental, both of these things we're not allowed to do in human. You're only allowed to do things that are tried and safe. Um, but if we want to move ahead and, and uh, uh, improve things, we're trying to do things that, that nobody has ever done. And so these kinds of experiments uh, require us um, to go for the mouse. We wouldn't know a better way to do it. And so what we've done 
is we've recreated uh, this exact process. Disease, um, uh, prostate cancer that starts uh, in cells of the prostate. And we've been able to make those cells glow so that super sensitive cameras can, can see them. And that's shown in color here. So th this is what we call a heat map. Wherever there's red, there's tumor. And you can see that over time, this tumor spreads and it spreads to different parts of the body. And that's the analogy to what I showed you before. What we, in the human case. What we could also show is that if we do what is being done to treat humans, if we, um, if we treat the, 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 to treat the disease, we need to um, get rid of male hormones like testosterone. And the easiest way to do that is uh, by castration. And when we do that in an animal, you can see that we can essentially cure it of all the disease, or we can at least make the situation better. But the problem is that this is only temporary because the disease will come back. And when it comes back, um, the mouse, uh, it will come back very rapidly and the mouse will die. So, so this mouse will be fine for about two months, but then uh, the disease will take over. Uh, and that's what happens in all men essentially. All men that get um, this kind of therapy will eventually see the disease come back. However, if they're very old when this therapy uh, is started, they might die of something completely different, something very natural, before that time point here uh, where the disease has come back. So this tells us our, our model is ready to um, uh, 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 study the disease and, and we're, we're trying to do this in parallel. So there's the human disease, and there's our model that we call rapid cap. And we're trying to understand what's going on in the rapid cap model in order to conclu make conclusions or prediction, uh, predictions of what's going on in the human case. And so the first thing uh, that we have to do in order to understand that, the opportunity that we have is to try and understand how cells move around when they're leaving the tumor. And this is something that we can't uh, really do in the human and we can't even do um, or we couldn't even do in the mouse case because what it requires us to do is to put the entire organ, which is the prostate, the mouse prostate in this case, put it under a microscope and analyze the entire organ, which is many millions of cells, but the cancer cells at that point are only very few perhaps tens, dozens. And so we would have to be able um, to span that entire thing, just like Google Maps where you can see the entire world, but then you can go into the street view. We would have to be able to do both as well, see the entire organ with millions of cells, but then zoom in into just a single cell. And um, the, by, by working together with people who study the brain, uh, we were able to solve this because people who study the brain have to do the same thing. They want to see the entire brain, but then just look at single cells, single nerve cells and see where they are. And so um, they've developed a machine, which is a microscope that will, will scan over an organ. And I'm showing a brain here. You see how this picture is assembled section by section, they're scanning through the entire thing. And then afterwards, they're cutting through a layer and record the next layer so that just like you're cutting through an onion, layer by layer by layer, you will ultimately have the entire picture of the entire brain in three dimensions. And that's because, as I said, um, when the image, the, the, my, the imaging has been done, all the pictures are taken, there's a knife that cuts through this uh, uh, brain here and uh, the, the section floats away and then the next uh, set of pictures is taken so you get the next layer. And so then uh, when that's done, um, uh, you go to a computer and you start to do what we call reconstruction. And actually I wanna show you uh, more recent reconstruction that we did. So you, you try to do then a um, 3D analysis 
of what's going on. I'm going to share that movie uh, here. So um, here. Okay. So. Here we are. Okay, so you should be seeing a screen now that shows this reconstruction. And it's showing the prostate gland. This is the entire gland. It looks like a, a couple of um, gloves. And what you're seeing in red here is where the tumor is. So the tumor are the bright red cells that we're zooming in now. And as you can tell, there's only about 50 or so cells that are tumor. And um, in the entire prostate, as I mentioned before, is some a couple million cells. So this approach uh, allowed us to find this, what we call needle in the haystack, because uh, only about 50 cells of 5 million are the ones that we're looking for. But we want to see the entire thing, and obviously we want to find them. So there's, there's not really good ways other than this approach to finding these few cells, okay? Okay, so each, each little dot here is one cell. Okay, let's go back to the end. And there you go, that's the entire prostate now. Good. Okay, so now if I go back and share uh, the regular screen again. Um, one of the things that we cared about here was um, that if we see a tumor, what is that going to look like? And um, one thing that we found is um, something really surprising. When we look at really, really high resolution at a tumor, and these are the cells uh, like I showed them before, what you're seeing is a blob. Um, and that's a classic, that's what we would call a tumor mass. Many cells that are red here because we could paint them. Um, but what we could also find is some cells that are completely different and they have escaped from that tumor. You see a very fine connection to the tumor, but they moved out. And so um, we started to be able, we realized that with this model now and with this microscopy, we can be looking at what it look what 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 it looks like when cells escape from the tumor, and this is um, happening at a at a stage where so few cells have escaped that nobody's ever seen it, and so um, we started to take pictures and movies of that. And these are all essentially three dimensional renderings of it. And so I'm gonna show you to close out a few of those first images um, that we've seen of what it looks like when cells start to uh, escape from the prostate. And so um, I wanna show you this thing here. Um, okay, you should be, yes. So, As mentioned, this is a first. Um, nobody's ever seen that, and we're looking at it for the first time too. So in red, you can see a tumor. This is about. Um, uh, this is at a later stage when cells, when there are more cells that have moved out. In green, you see all the normal cells, and this is the the layers um, uh, that are the normal prostate. And now we're just scanning through those layers, and you see in red the tumor cells that are embedded in the green cells that we just had to strip out so we can actually see the red cells. And you can see that there are many cells that are floating around and these cells apparently are on their way out. And uh, uh, we're still uh, at a miss to understand why, why some of those cells stay where they are and form this mess and others are moving out. Okay. I'm going to show you another view of this. 
and that's here. So here you see another view of this, and this is now showing us all of the cells that have moved out. It's a bit more messy because there are really many cells that have moved out, but I'll, you'll see for yourself. So this is the entire prostate. Then we're peeling layers away and we're seeing all those red cells. The dark reds are closer to the tumor and those uh, uh, transparent ones are further away, but it's the same thing. And we're seeing how they are spread out all over the tissue. These are now single layers in green of the normal tissue. Everything that's not normal is shown in red. And so this is how you can see how we can use um, rendering technology. So this is 3D rendering technology, the type that's also used for uh, animated movies. Um, 3D rendering technology that takes actual images and transforms them into something that is easier to interpret for us. The actual image that uh, we actually recorded is the one that you saw before and you're going to see it again in green. And uh, here you see it. So that's the actual image. It's a, it's a layer and everything that's, that's uh, three-dimensional is uh, the rendering. Okay. So this is where we are uh, with this research. And as you can tell, you know, we're, we're, we're only exploring this. I mean, we have little concepts of what's going on here, but we're trying to find ways of understanding what's going on uh, with this. But the first thing to do here is to actually make these pictures, make these movies, analyze the situation, and then start to ask uh, the questions. Okay, so, so that's, that's what I wanted to show you. Um, I hope um, I gave you an impression of, uh, you know, A, how I got to do what I do, and B, what it is that we do and uh, see what's uh, lying ahead of us as we try to uh, understand what cancer is. All right, great. Thanks so much, Lloyd. And um, we had some comments, we had some questions, and so I want to remind the attendees everything from our uh, fifth grader who's joined us today, who really loves biology, uh, to some questions about tumors. So, Lloyd, can you see your Q&A um, yes. and also the chat? Yes. And, uh, maybe yes. you can start to address some of those. And then if other people have questions, science related, or even just, you know, how do you get to be a scientist? We'd love to hear those questions in the next couple of minutes and take those, uh, you know, give you some response. Okay, so the first thing I realized is that um, uh, the, the, the chats, uh, two of the chats are, are uh, picking up a buzzword that's really big in science today, and that's CAS9. And it's, it's funny because, uh, yes, it sounds like uh, some of you really, really are interested in, in, in science and are, are, are taking it in. Um, so in terms of the questions, uh, you know, CAS9 is a technology. We're using it as a technology. We're actually using it um, for some of the things that you have been seeing there. But it is a technology to do something completely. It, it's a technology to start to chop, that allows us to chop off things. And we're using it to mimic cancer because cancer um, uh, usually arises through mutations in DNA. And CAS9 can be used to engineer mutations in DNA. So it's an engineering tool. It itself, CAS9, does not interest us at all, as much as a scissor doesn't really, really interest a tailor. What we care about is the design and what we're getting out of it. So um, uh, I have one question here about, uh, uh, from, from Henry about cancer exploding. So cancer cells are the opposite of unstable Exploding cells, I would say. Successful cancer cells are unfortunately very, very well behaved. They roam the body in very, very clever ways and escape our immune systems, our designs to, to not allow them, essentially. So uh, unfortunately, cancer cells are actually quite um, uh, well adapted. Um, uh, it's a bit like an evolution 
process inside our bodies. And it would be great if they were less well adapted and the immune system, et cetera, could fight them more easily. I, I want to throw something in there. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it, Lloyd, or, you know, I've just been reading a little bit. Um, but I think everybody is familiar with the uh, vaccines that are coming out for COVID, yeah. which use this new strategy um, yeah. to introduce an mRNA, which I hope some of you might know, and you can ask the question if you don't know. And it was allowing us to really come up with a vaccine really quickly for COVID. Uh, and that technology has never been used to make a vaccine before. But there is hope, or I've read some articles that cancer cells that Lloyd just said, which also, you know, have clever ways to hide themselves from the immune system, it might be possible one day for us to also use vaccines to help us allow our immune system to specifically find some of these cancers in a way that wasn't possible. So it's really exciting science. I don't know if you've uh, seen any articles to that effect or have any comment, Lloyd, but thought I'd throw that in there. Yes, absolutely. I think it's very important. I, I think uh, um, the most important breakthroughs in cancer research recently have been the understanding that, the, that our immune system actually tries very hard to keep the cancer at bay, but the cancer oftentimes has found ways to escape that uh, uh, mechanism. And some cancer types are really, really vulnerable now that we understand uh, that this is happening. Unfortunately, prostate cancer is not among them. However, there's still a lot of interest, and especially now, uh, like Jason just said, realizing that with um, uh, getting RNA into people and mounting really new types of uh, um, uh, responses very fast, if we can do that in the animal models also, we can actually try these things much faster and have much faster cycles of trial and error. So uh, what we've been seeing over the last year with this, uh, you know, essentially within a year going from uh, an, uh, a, an idea and then to an actual therapeutic is totally unparalleled and is extremely exciting for us. So yes, we're, we're strong with RNA and RNA medicines at Cold Spring Harbor. We should really in, 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 uh, in, in invest in that and, and do it, yeah. I have some question here about, you know, how would a high school student be able to work in a lab? And I mean, definitely Jason is one of the key uh, uh, access points for exactly that question. There is a, also, we have a, a dedicated program for high school students and that's the Partners for the Future program. So I would say if you, if you Google that, Partners for the Future, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, uh, that, that is a perfect program we have every year. There's a high school student working in my lab. The last one, I just won a prize from Regeneron. So it's, it's really, and I mean, it's always been great. It's always fun to have you guys around. So you're always welcome. I'm going to put the link to the Partners for the Future in the chat for everybody. Right. And um, also, um, I will say that we have uh, the uh, summer camps at the Learning Center. So if you haven't visited us, and hopefully we're back to some form of in-person uh, summer camps, um, those are gonna be announced shortly. But I think you have some other questions, Lloyd. There's one about college. I don't know if you saw that one. No, where's the college question? Um, so there, I'll read it to you. It's in the Q&A, yes. maybe you missed it. Do you think that getting into a good college will make it easier to become a scientist? It's a good question. I have an answer, but look, we're here to talk to Lloyd. <laughs> I would say your, your, your college is, um, so I didn't go to college here, right? So the, the whole question of good college, not so good college, best college, whatever, um, wasn't the question for me because there's only, you know, uh, in Europe, there's your university uh, you graduate, there's university, and there's not much of a choice. And those are usually good. In, I mean, they're good. They're good enough uh, um, to, to, to get you to where you want. I would say what really matters is um, that you have exposure um, to different things. Uh, because, as I mentioned before, you probably need some time to find out what you really like. And... Um, the thing uh, uh, that really gets you going is the one where you're also most likely to excel at and, and, and where you're able to contribute. And also, you know, 
um, you know, pick yourself up again after a failure because those happen all the time. But if you're really excited about something, you know, it's, it's, you, you have this inner motor and, and so probably a college that allows you to, to, to see a, a breadth of things uh, is probably the, the, the best one. And I would also say that um, uh, as we just mentioned with the uh, Partners for the Futures program, there's overall so many opportunities here um, uh, that you can just take yourself. You can email uh, people, uh, uh, you can go to talks, contact people. And if you're interested, you know, people will find ways to interact with you and to engage you. So I think that is as important as, you know, the good college, the fact that you've been able to uh, 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 go out there and, and find places to uh, do what you like. Uh, so, so people who have been working in labs are usually the most exciting to talk to for me. Yeah, I agree with that. If you have, once you find what you really like and what you really love, then nothing will stop you. Um, now that said, uh, if you wanna make it easier, you probably wanna look ahead if possible to see if you know already that you're interested in research, you do wanna to try to go to a college where they do have a research opportunity where research is being done now, sometimes that may not be possible. Maybe you live in a place where it's hard to get to such a college, or maybe you, uh, your grades weren't the best and you felt that maybe you didn't get into exactly the college that you want. Um, actually, it turns out that almost half of the people who graduate with a degree in the sciences started at a community college. So a really small college that probably didn't even do research, but they were really interested in that and they maybe did two years of college at a smaller school and then were able to transfer to a larger school that did research. And that's common here on Long Island. You can go to one of the community colleges and they already have agreements that you can transfer easily those credits to a state school. So there's a lot of different ways um, to go from whatever college you are at into a research career, if that's what you're interested in. So I want to allow another moment or so to see if we have any last minute questions. I just want to double up yeah, on that. Please go ahead. I, I, I can assure you, if I get a, a, an email from somebody who's at a community college, um, who's interested in doing science, they will have an interview with people from my lab and me, and we'll try to find out if you're a good fit to actually come to our, our lab. So the last one that we had was from LIU, and he was in our lab for about two years. And I know he's on papers that we that we published. So I mean, there's an, absolutely. If I get an email from anybody who wants to work in the lab, um, things are going to happen for sure. Don't buy the hype. You don't have to be in Harvard or MIT. That's not where all of our scientists come from. It's great if you go there and you enjoy it, but there's a lot of different ways. Um, I don't see any more questions, and we are at time. And we try to keep these short so that you can come to all of them, but not be burned out from a whole day of Zoom school. So I wanna thank Lloyd so much for joining us and maybe we'll do it again next year because we, we may have a whole cycle. And then also you'll be able, um, people who registered and others, you'll be able to see the recording. So if there's something you missed, you'll be able to go back and, and talk to it. And maybe one day you'll be emailing Lloyd and saying you have some research ideas and maybe you can work together. So thank you so much Lloyd for joining us and we invite everybody to come back in February for our next installment. So we'll see you next time. Great to be here as always. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone.